All right, so I'm so excited to be here with Dr. Mola. Tell me about yourself, Dr. Mola. <laughs> well, um, where do I start? Well, I think, I mean, I think you should know me pretty well because um, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, this is a picture of me when I was like, I don't know, 11, 12, <laughs> maybe, maybe 13. And who's that guy? That's me. <laughs> that was me. And right. that other guy might be you. Right, um, right. Yes. We may or may not be related. But Chris, yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm an endocrinologist um, and um, I'm living in Germany. And um, so I work for the U.S. government as a army civilian at Launchstool Regional Medical Center. So this is a, um, a military hospital in Germany for the U.S. government. And before being here, I, I trained in, um, in Boston. Well, that's awesome. You're an awesome doctor. I'm psyched to have you here. Um, I guess today we wanted to talk about all these different wearable technologies that patients can have for diabetes that we see in the ER. And I vaguely know, I get the gist of it, but I don't actually really know. I'm sure there's so much more I could learn about how these continuous glucose monitors work and insulin pumps and where they could go wrong. So I'm hoping you could teach me some stuff and uh, I'll be able to use it on my next shift. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, this is really a passion of mine, full disclosure. Um, I have type one diabetes. I, I um, was diagnosed when I was five years old and I was lucky um, to live through a really transformative time in medicine when, um, you know, I saw how glucose monitoring began with like using urine um, and urine dipsticks to um, capillary glucose readings um, that took uh, two minutes to get a reading and a real lot of blood. Um, and then those devices, those finger stick, you know, blood glucose meters got smaller and smaller and faster and faster. And then the invention of um, continuous glucose monitors came and um, those really revolutionized how we can measure glucose levels in patients with diabetes. And it really has changed people's lives. They work really well when they work, but sometimes things can go wrong. So um, I think there's some opportunity to learn, to be a little bit more aware about what these devices are and, and how they're helpful for patients and where they can go wrong. All right. So yeah, let's, let's talk about it. Teach me. All right. So you want to talk a little bit about CGMs as they're called, but the long name for that is continuous glucose monitors. So let me share a little um, screen with you. Perfect. You see that? Yeah, I can. Okay. So um, continuous glucose monitors are small devices that you wear on your skin that measure your glucose levels continuously. And um, unlike a finger stick or a urine measurement, this is something which is constantly sampling um, how much sugar is in the body and making, making, you know, adjustments to, add, you know, estimate what that blood sugar value is. And it's, we're giving live data every couple minutes. And it's not only giving a blood glucose value, but it's giving a direction or a trend. So this is a really, um, exciting, you know, capability. And I'll show you an example of that in, in a minute. For whatever reason, if you're curious if they have one, the places you'll want to look um, is the areas that are shaded in blue in this diagram in the bottom right hand corner. So, you know, typically the fronts or back of the arms, um, the stomach is a really, really common place. Um, sometimes the back and sometimes the, you know, the upper gluteus um, or the thighs. I, I'd say the thighs are least commonly used, um, but the arms and the stomach are the, probably the most common places to look for them. I'm noticing that it's actually, it's interesting, it's measuring interstitial glucose, not blood glucose. Does that have any clinical difference or are they basically the same number? 
No, that's a great question. So I have a picture actually that shows um, that maybe a little bit more clearly. Um, so can you see this image in the upper right hand corner with the uh, um, yeah. sensor? So um, what you're measuring with a CGM is the glucose level in the interstitial fluid. So if you can imagine the blood capillary is right next to the subcutaneous tissue where the interstitial fluid is. Um, glucose will dissolve into these different spaces at different rates. And so the subcutaneous tissue glucose may lag behind the glucose level in the blood capillary. Or if you were to do a venous blood, there's, yeah, there's going to be a, a lag behind. So um, it's, it's typically very, very accurate, especially when the glucose is flat. But at times when the glucose is changing rapidly, um, it may delay by 10 to 20 minutes okay. behind. Well, that's good to know. Um, making that change. So, um, so the different components for a CGM are going to be the sensor. So there's like a little metal flexible wire, which is um, measuring the glucose. Um, and that's the sensor um, component. On top of the sensor is a transmitter. So a battery and a transmitter, which is going to send a Bluetooth signal with that glucose reading to a reader device over here. And the reader device could now be a cell phone um, or it could be a separate um, device. And I'll show you some examples of that. But, but now I would say most patients are using a cell phone or an insulin pump as the receiver. Um, and uh, they won't have a separate trend, you know, receiver with them. But um, places where things can go wrong are obviously you see this little wire um, that's in the skin. Sometimes those wires can break um, and get stuck in the skin and cause infections. Um, so that's not that common, but it's something that may lead a patient with type one diabetes to go to the ER. Um, these can also come out of the skin. And if they come out from the skin, even if it looks like it's still you know, attached, if the wire is not in the interstitial fluid, but it's above the skin or um, outside of the skin, it's not gonna give any accurate readings. Um, mm. So that can be a problem for patients. Um, and then if the transmitter, um, the battery dies, then no signal will get to the, you know, to the receiving device. Um, and so they will not get glucose values then. Um, so how, that's kind of an overview. Kind of, how long do these things last or are they different depending on the brand? Yeah, it depends on the brand, but I would say on average, these are things that are put on the skin and last for about 10 to 10 days to two weeks. Okay. And then you just have to you get a bunch in a pack and you just swap it out every couple of days. Weeks. Yeah. Every, every 10 days to two weeks. So, you know, two to three a month, but if one fails, then, you know, that means you need to have a backup one to replace it with. And most of them um, have a, a lag time when they are put in. So they're put into the skin by the patient at home. Um, and then they need a, about two hours to warm up. And that period of time for warm up is getting shorter and shorter. It used to be, you know, up to 12 hours and now it's down to two hours. The next generation ones are going to be even quicker, 30 minutes. So, um, so just let me show you some examples of what they will look like. So um, one very popular one is, is a Dexcom. So um, the most current version um, that's FDA approved is the G6. And this can provide glucose data that can be sent to a receiver like what you see here, but also can be sent to a um, cell phone. This one is uh, giving you a glucose reading in milligram, in, I'm sorry, millimole per um, liter, not milligram per deciliter. So <laughs> don't get worried about uh, blood sugar at six. But as you can see, there's like a little bar graph right here. Um, and, you know, this is showing a different glucose value every five minutes. And, you know, the blood glucose values in big letters or, um, at the top or big, you know, 
big number at the top. And you see also there's like a little arrow and that arrow can point up or down and, you know, can point straight up or straight down if the glucose is changing rapidly, you know, like after a meal or, um, yeah. you know, when a patient is ill and it will set alarms when the blood sugar is outside of the expected range. So here's another example. Freestyle Libre is a very common one. Patients with type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes will wear these, but these are really popular because they are less expensive. They can be um, purchased at a pharmacy, um, um, even without a prescription. Um, then another device is a Medtronic one, and that can work even with a cell phone um, as well, like the other ones. And then uh, another unique one that I mentioned before is this implantable um, CGM that the sensor is actually implanted as a procedure um, under the skin and it can be there for 90 days and recently was approved for up to 180 days. It's quite small. Um, and then a transmitter sits on top of the skin above where the sensor is um, and it can transmit it to a phone or a watch. That's cool. So that's kind of the overview of um, CGMs. When we see them, we don't trust the numbers. We sort of get our own finger sticks, which is reasonable. But I think what makes this so interesting, like you said, is you can see this trend and you can you can get a sense, like let's say there's a DKA patient, you could see the trend with which their sugars are coming down. It gives you a lot more predictive value than sort of just getting these random finger sticks that the nurse may be busy, may wait a half an hour. You don't know what happened in between. So stuff like that. I think that's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, again, the accuracy of these um, CGMs is is really good, but it it won't beat a finger stick or a venous glucose um, whenever there's any doubt if the device is working properly. Um, and they were approved um, for use in hospitalized patients. So during the COVID pandemic. Um, uh, the FDA approved the use of CGMs for patients with COVID um, who are hospitalized. And, and I think the future, you know, CGMs may be more relied upon for hospitalized patients because it does give um, a lot more data. Um, so I think that's something in the future um, that we should be ready for. Now, when these things start to break down or to reach the end of their lifespan after 10 days or so, do they just start giving you weird numbers or does, does it tell you that it, it's the battery's dying or whatever? I mean, the, the honest truth is, you know, I've done some self-research with these sensors. You know, they're rated for 10 days or, or 14 days, but they can, they can usually last 30 days and provide pretty good accuracy. Um, but they will generally work best actually after 24 hours of being put on and until the end of, you know, their time period, and then they'll give you a warning and then, and then stop giving new data, even though they technically are still collecting data, the, the apps and the readers are set up to stop sending data until you okay. change it out for a new one okay. and there's probably some financial incentive for the companies to sure. make you put a new one in sure even if even if it still works so things that can go wrong that wire can get dislodged the wire can get broken um the battery can die the transmitter can fail Are there any other yeah. complications that we should be thinking about so these are Bluetooth devices. So, you know, the, if the device that you're reading it from is too far away, um, it won't, it'll lose connection. Um, and then there can be some connection issues. There also used to be um, some issues with accuracy related to medication. So um, acetaminophen was um, known to cause irregular readings in many of the CGMs, in the older generation CGMs. Um, but the newer generations are now resistant to um, abnormally, reading abnormally low blood glucose in response to acetaminophen.
Okay. Um, but I think, yeah, the main issues are going to be the sensor um, wire breaking or, or falling out of the skin or there being a connection error um, or the transmitter battery dying. And it sounds like infection risk is possible, but pretty low from what I can tell. Pretty low with the, with the CGMs, yeah. Okay, great. That's super useful. What else you got for us? Okay, so the other um, major development for you know treating diabetes has been um, insulin pumps, um, and so you know insulin pumps have been around for um, a really long time, um, but they're just getting smarter and um, just more capable. Um, so the way that patients that are on insulin um, had traditionally been treating or using insulin, uh, generally they using a basal bolus regimen. So like a long acting insulin and then a short acting insulin with meals or, you know, at times when they need it. So um, to borrow, you know, just to show you an example of that. So, you know, a patient who's insulin dependent would take insulin once a day um, at night, well, long acting insulin, and then um, they take injections at their meal times, um, and that's the short acting insulin or rapid acting insulin. Um, what insulin pumps do is they use only rapid acting insulin. And rather than giving one long acting insulin, they're giving many little doses of insulin an hour, and that's called the basal rate. So it's giving like 0.3 or 0.2 units of insulin every five minutes to give a cumulative amount of insulin of uh, maybe one unit per hour. And if you multiply that times 24 hours, that's the approximate dose of a long acting insulin that a patient would be getting. So that's what an insulin pump can do is, is give a basal rate many times an hour. And the great thing about the insulin pump is that you can give more basal insulin. You can program it to give more basal insulin at certain times of the day um, and less at other times of the day when you need less. Rather than you know one shot that's kind of fixed basal, you can adjust that amount of insulin throughout different times of the day. And then you can also give these short acting boluses for meals or for correcting high blood sugars, and you can give multiple. So, you know, rather than having to give an injection for each meal, you could give a little bolus for a snack and a little bolus for another snack. And if you skip a meal, you can skip the, the bolus. Um, so there's, I think, a lot of flexibility with the insulin pump um, in that way. And just to be clear, when you're talking about a basal dose, it's not a long acting insulin. It's just a little bit of short acting, short acting insulin going. Yeah. Out. So okay. these little, these little bumps that you're seeing here are like micro doses of that short acting insulin that only last a little bit amount of time, but they, they end up acting just like a, a long acting insulin. In a way, it's you a know, lot cumulative. More how normal insulin would work in the first place, where the pancreas is con continuously secreting as much insulin as it thinks it needs. Exactly. All right. So, you know, getting back to, um, you know, what, what is an insulin pump or what, you know, what are the components? So um, I think that's, a, I think it'd be a good idea to talk about what are the basic components of an insulin pump? So sorry, this isn't the best image, but um, the important points about a, or the important portions of an insulin pump are going to include a syringe or a reservoir. Um, so different pumps will have a different way of storing the insulin, but they essentially will contain either a, a, um, a bag or a syringe that contains insulin. And that will be filled up by the patient when they first set up the pump. And this pump site usually is changed every two to four days. Um, wow. So every two to four days, they will fill it up again and put a new sensor, a new system on. 
But so one of the components is right here is, is going to be the, um, the reservoir. And this is the bottle of insulin that they're filling it with. So then the next component- that reservoir up, reservoir up with the insulin that they get in the packet. Yeah, they, well, they have a, you know, they'll have a bottle of insulin that they store separately, but the, the reservoir, yeah, it's going to be a new one each time. Um, and they're going to fill it up with how much insulin they think they'll need for, you know, the two to four days that they, that they wear it for before changing it again. Um, okay. And then that's connected to um, a tube, which is a hollow tube where the insulin can be pushed through. Um, and at the end of the tube is a um, initially a needle, and then that needle um, has a little catheter around it. And so when they put the pump into their skin, what they're doing is they're putting a needle into their skin and then pulling the needle out. And all that stays in is a short catheter. Um, oh, and, um, and this is going another, into the sub -Q tissue. And this is going into the subacute tissue. So as you can see in this image, um, the infusion um, set will be set on the skin, you know, with a kind of an adhesive. And there's a little catheter cannula that goes into the subcutaneous skin that will push the insulin through. And the, that tube is connected to the insulin pump, which is basically a very precise motor with algorithms to tell the motor how much to give. The insulin pump itself does not have its own CGM on it. They can interact with the CGM, but the pump itself is just a device that controls how much insulin is pushed through the tubing and then into the body. Oh, so it doesn't know what your sugar is. It just can give you insulin. The basic insulin pump does not know what the blood sugar is. The next generation insulin pumps, and I'll show you some examples, will integrate information from a separate CGM that the patient may be wearing on their skin um, and will integrate that information into that device to help drive how much insulin is delivered. Gotcha. And now these pump, the pumps themselves, they're just sitting in somebody's pocket or something like that? They're, yeah, they could be sitting in their pocket. Um, uh, but, you know, so men have pockets in all their pants, but women may not wear clothes with the pockets. So, um, you know, they may wear them in their bra or um, you can have like a, a garter strap or like a fanny pack to put it in. Uh, so there's different places to put them, but generally people will put them in their pocket for this type of insulin pump. But there's another type of insulin pump, which um, is called a pod um, type pump. And there's one company that makes a pod type pump. And so the pod type pump is a circular um, pod that has a motor, a battery, and the reservoir of insulin all in one. And it's a kind of a dumb motor. It, it has a radio transmitter in it and it gets all of its information from a separate remote control, you know, controller, which um, can sit separately, but there's no wires and there's no tubes connecting the pod that's directly on the skin to the controller. So it can be more discreet. And so that's called the Omnipod. And but then uh, if you, if you want to change out, if you want to refill that insulin, you got to take the whole thing off, I'm guessing. Correct. Yeah. So this is, again, something that can only be worn for, you know, three to four days, um, but it can be controlled from, um, you know, a controller pod or, you know, a, um, a controller device that's separate. You know, this is the older generation looking um, controller. The newer one looks more like a cell phone um, or it can be used uh, and controlled by a cell phone. Um, but this is a tubeless insulin pump. And just like the CGMs, these pumps are generally placed in the stomach, um, sometimes on the arms. The pods can be put on the arms. The, the tubed insulin pumps aren't usually put on the arms, but occasionally. Um, and then the upper gluteus um, or the back. 
um, and then sometimes on the thighs, but less commonly. And when you change out these pods, are you throwing them away the way you're doing with the CGMs or you're sort of just refilling it and putting it somewhere else? No, these are all disposable. Um, disposable. So yeah, the pods are thrown away. The, um, the tubes and the infusion sets are thrown away. And they're technically biohazards if they've been in your skin. Right, okay. Why do you have to switch it out every three days? Well, it's really, it's the limit to how long the body is going to allow a foreign object to be delivering non-sterile, you know, medicine into one site. Um, you know, there's an inflammatory reaction to um, anything that's in the skin. And the infusion site is hypoallergenic, but it's still causes an inflammatory reaction. And that will reduce the efficacy of the pump over time. So the insulin will maybe be broken down by the immune system or the inflammation in the area will reduce the speed that it's absorbed. But either way, the, over time, um, the pump won't work as well um, the longer it stays in beyond three days. So I'll just show you a couple examples of like some of the more popular ones that you may see on patients. Um, so here's an older um, generation one. You can see it's a black and white screen, um, kind of a small screen, a couple buttons. Newer generation from the same company um, will have not only insulin pump, um, but also will have the capability to communicate with a continuous glucose monitor. So it will have a blood sugar and the insulin information all in the pump. And there's no tube shown here, but this is a tubed insulin pump. Um, so the infusion site would be on the skin um, and this would go on the pocket or you know, connected on a belt or something along those lines. Um, and then this is the pod so the tubeless insulin pump that we talked about. And this company also has a hybrid um, auto drive um, pump system that works with a continuous glucose monitor. And then um, another popular one is, a, is called the Tandem T-Slim. And this one also has a model which um, can interact with the continuous glucose monitor and have an auto drive type um, feature. So um, three companies, three big companies that you will see um, will have pumps that can have auto drive, you know, self, um, self um, adjusting basal rates for patients. So I'm just trying to think if we could walk through, I'm trying to think of where these things can go wrong. So if we're talking about just the insulin pump where there's no glucose monitoring attached to it. The patient is checking their own sugars throughout the day and sort of programming things as they see fit. Is that, am I right in saying that kind of thing? Yeah, so yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and so, um, you know, the, so the things that can go wrong with an insulin pump, um, you know, even a, a basic insulin pump, um, but this is true for all of them, the pod, podded insulin pumps and the ones that are connected by infusion sets. So they can have something called occlusion um, errors or um, blocked delivery errors. So just like with IVs that can, you know, where the tube can get kinked, the same can happen with an insulin pump. And um, this can cause patients to go into DKA because they may feel like the pump is working and they may think they're getting insulin, but um, it can take a, a long time for the pump to realize that as it's trying to inject insulin, it's not, it's not going through because the, the infusion site is kinked or maybe the infusion site came out of the skin and, and got um, got blocked by blood or by something else. So, so eventually um, it'll send you an error warning, but that may happen later than you want it to. Right. 
Okay. You know, let's say it's in the middle of the night when it happens, um, you know, they roll over and they pull it out or something, um, you know, they're only delivering a little bit of insulin every hour as their basal insulin. And it usually takes about seven units of failed the um, insulin to be tried to be delivered for the pump to realize. So that, that can take several hours. Right. Um, so the patient may start to feel sick, may wake up feeling um, unwell um, before they realize that the pump had a, um, a blocked delivery. And okay. sometimes um, patients can tell that it wasn't working because you know their skin um, or their clothes around the pump may be wet. You know, they are giving themselves insulin and it's not going into their skin. It's, it's just getting put on out on the outside. Um, and that may be a sign that, you know, right. the pump became um, dislodged. Another similar problem that can happen is the tubing for the tubed insulin pumps. The tubing can get cut or snagged, um, you know, maybe got caught in the door and, you know, got cut or, um, you know, some other maybe rock climbing and, um, you know, it got caught on something and it got cut. I mean, these tubes are very strong and they're very resistant to getting broken, but it does occasionally happen. And sometimes it can be a subtle um, snag in the tubing that can lead the insulin to leak out. And, um, and that can lead to um, DKA um, or high blood sugars. Patients on insulin pumps, because they don't have basal insulin, they're more, much more susceptible to getting very high blood sugars and DKA um, because, you know, the longer they're, they're without that, that basal insulin, yeah, the, the quicker they are likely to have a problem. Right. Okay. And that's something to keep in mind when a patient is maybe sent for an MRI and, um, they're wearing an insulin pump and they're told to take it off because, you know, I can't go in the MRI room. Um, you know, if there's a delay in getting that MRI and the pump has been taken off, um, their blood sugars are going to rise pretty quickly. Right. That makes sense. Okay. What other complications could we be thinking about with these insulin pumps? So another problem um, that's much more common with the insulin pumps at the infusion site is infections. Um, so if a patient didn't clean their skin um, when they placed it, um, or if they tried to leave it in for too long, um, they can develop irritation and infection. And, um, you know, autoimmune or, um, allergy type reactions to um, the infusion sites are much more common and they can lead to cellulitis um, or um, other infections. So, um, a, you know, a good idea to examine a patient who's not feeling well, who's wearing an insulin pump is just to look at the sites where they place their pumps to make sure they don't have signs of infections at those sites. Um, Cause sometimes you know, if they've been trying to wear it for more than four days, um, they can develop irritation and, um, you know, and um, pus at those sites. Okay. Um, another issue that can happen is the insulin pumps can get broken. You know, they can get dropped, cracked, or um, waterlogged. The more recent or newer insulin pumps are waterproof, but, you know, everything has a failure rate. So, um, you know, if a patient, you know, abuses their pump, like their cell phone, you know, eventually they can break it. And um, yeah, how are people you know, shopping with these pumps and stuff? They just disconnect the pump and go in the shower or? Yeah. So the, the, the two insulin pumps can be disconnected, usually at the skin. There's like a little fancy, way for them to disconnect it at the skin. Um, and they just have like a very small um, adapter on the skin site and, you know, they can take the pump off. And usually up for an hour, it's no problem with their blood sugar. Um, but beyond an hour, then 
they may start to have problems with the blood sugar starting to go up. Um, the same with swimming or, you know, water activities, usually it's advised that they take them off, even though the pumps are supposed to be water resistant or even waterproofed to some degree. Okay. Are there ever scenarios where these things malfunction and just deliver too much insulin or that would have to be a user error where they're putting in the wrong numbers and delivering too much? So, so for the hybrid, um, hybrid systems, you know, there's always a possibility of a falsely elevated glucose um, detected by a CGM. And that's pretty uncommon, but um, if the blood sugar on the CGM is reading higher than it actually is, it, it could cause the insulin pump to give more insulin. Um, insulin pumps don't generally, they have lots of mechanisms to check how much they're delivering and to make sure that anytime the motor is activated, it's, it's because um, you know, a patient is telling it to. Um, and there are even limits on how much insulin can be delivered at a time or per hour to prevent accidentally giving, you know, 40 or 50 units of insulin at a time accidentally by just hitting buttons. Um, but, um, yeah, I think, you know, over insulinating is, is much, much less common with insulin pumps. Um, there is a kind of a rare, um, possible issue where um, when flying and changes in altitude can cause air bubbles and that can potentially push more insulin in but um, there's been a few case reports of that but it's pretty uncommon not something I think you'll see um, another thing that I did want to mention though is um, is damaged insulin um, so the insulin is um, the rapid acting insulins that are used in insulin pumps um, are pretty stable at room temperature, but, you know, especially in this heat, um, if insulin is left out, it loses its activity. Um, and so another issue that can occur in patients is if they're um, having their insulin out in, you know, in high heat for extended periods of time, the insulin may lose its activity. And they may be using their insulin properly and giving themselves boluses and it's delivered, but it's just not working. And that may be because their insulin may have been um, exposed to too much heat. Gotcha. So error messages you may see on the insulin pumps, you may see that there's a, you know, that the, there's a delivery issue. The, the machine may pick up on that. I'm assuming if there's a battery issue or there's a break. The machine will pick up on that, but bad insulin, it wouldn't, it wouldn't know. Yeah. There's no way for the pump to know. And that you may only be able to figure out from asking the patient, you know, well, you know, when did you last change your insulin pump and um, where was that insulin stored? You know, like, did you, you know, if like for, I've had patients that maybe, um, are homeless and so they're getting their insulin from clinics but you know in the summertime they may be storing their insulin um on their person and that you know if it's 85 degrees out you know the yeah. insulin isn't going to last um a month like it should at you know at colder temperatures or more you know room temperature. regular temperatures yeah okay well this is great i mean it sounds like you know worse comes to worse if we don't can't figure out what's going on, we could just remove the pump entirely, remove the CGM, and just do things yeah. in the ER. But if these things are working, they could be useful adjuncts that we can get data off of, especially the CGM, probably more than the insulin pump. But yeah, you know, I think um, the other thing to keep in mind is that you know these many of these patients live with their disease um, all the time, and so. Um, they'll often be pretty good at managing. So if, if a patient with type one comes in with, a, you know, a broken wrist or a, you know, you know, a, you know, a mechanical injury um, that's not related to their diabetes and they're cognizant, you know, they may be better at managing their glucose 
um, than the nurse who can only check them once an hour and, you know, has to wait for an order for insulin to, you know, mm. it may be better for them to be on their pump. Respecting the patient's um, autonomy to some degree, you know, within safe range, you know, may be something that we can do more of in the future. Um, I think, you know, even for hospitalized patients, um, they're demonstrating their ability to manage their diabetes when they're admitted for other reasons. Um, with you know, under the supervision and, um, and help from the nursing staff and the physicians. I love that. 